The Third Ingredient by O. Henry. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This reading by Tomahaw. The so called Vallambrosa apartment house is not an apartment house. It is composed of two old fashioned brownstone front residences welded into one. The parlor floor of one side is gay with the wraps and headgear of a modiste. The other is lugubrious with the sophistical promises and grisly display of a painless dentist. You may have a room there for two dollars a week, or you may have one for twenty dollars. Among the Vallambrosa's rumors are stenographers, musicians, brokers, shop girls, space rate writers, art students, wiretappers, and other people who lean far over the banister rail when the doorbell rings. This treatise shall have to do with but two of the Vallambrosians though meaning no disrespect to the others. At six o'clock one afternoon, Hetty Pepper came back to her third-floor rear $3.50 room in the Vallambrosa with her nose and chin more sharply pointed than usual. To be discharged from the department store where you've been working four years and with only 15 cents in your purse does have a tendency to make your features appear more finely chiseled. And now for Hetty's thumbnail biography while she climbs the two flights of stairs. She walked into the biggest store one morning four years before with 75 other girls applying for a job behind the waste department counter. The phalanx of wage earners formed a bewildering scene of beauty, carrying a total mass of blonde hair sufficient to have justified the horseback gallops of a hundred Lady Godivas. The capable, cool-eyed, impersonal, young, bald-headed man, whose task it was to engage six of the contestants, was aware of a feeling of suffocation, as if he were drowning in a sea of frangipani, while white clouds, hand-embroidered, floated about him. And then a sail hove into sight. Hetty Pepper, homely of countenance, with small, contemptuous green eyes and chocolate-colored hair, dressed in a suit of plain burlap and a common-sense hat, stood before him with every one of her twenty-nine years of life unmistakably in sight. "'You're on!' shouted the bald-headed young man, and was saved. And that is how Hetty came to be employed in the biggest store." The story of her rise to an eight-dollar-a-week salary is the combined stories of Hercules, Joan of Arc, Una, Job, and Little Red Riding Hood. You shall not learn from me the salary that was paid her as a beginner. There is a sentiment growing about such things, and I want no millionaire store proprietors climbing the fire escape of my tenement house to throw dynamite bombs into my skylight boudoir. The story of Hetty's discharge from the biggest store is so nearly a repetition of her engagement as to be monotonous. In each department of the store there is an omniscient, omnipresent, and omnivorous person carrying always a mileage book and a red necktie, and referred to as a buyer. The destinies of the girls in his department who live on, see Bureau of Victual Statistics, so much per week are in his hands. This particular buyer was a capable, cool-eyed, impersonal, young, bald-headed man. As he walked along the aisles of his department, he seemed to be sailing on a sea of frangipani, while white clouds, machine-embroidered, floated around him. Too many sweets bring surfeit. He looked upon Hetty Pepper's homely countenance, emerald eyes, and chocolate-colored hair as a welcome oasis of green in a desert of cloying beauty. In a quiet angle of a counter, he pinched her arm kindly, three inches above the elbow. She slapped him three feet away with one good blow of her muscular, and not especially lily-white, right. So now you know why Eddie Pepper came to leave the biggest store at thirty minutes' notice with one dime and a nickel in her purse. This morning's quotations list the price of rib beef at six cents per butcher's pound. But on the day that Hetty was released by the B.S., the price was seven and one-half cents. That fact is what makes this story possible. Otherwise, the extra four cents would have... But the plot of nearly all the good stories in the world is concerned with shorts who were unable to cover, so you can find no fault with this one. Hetty mounted with her rib beef to her $3.50 third floor back. One hot, savory beef stew for supper, a night's good sleep, 
and she would be fit in the morning to apply again for the tasks of Hercules, Joan of Arc, Una, Job, and Little Red Riding Hood. In her room she got the granite ware stew pan out of the two by four foot china or I mean earthenware closet and began to dig down in a rat's nest of paper bags for the potatoes and onions. She came out with her nose and chin just a little sharper pointed. There was neither a potato nor an onion. Now what kind of a beef stew can you make out of simply beef? You can make oyster soup without oysters turtle soup without turtles, coffee cake without coffee, but you can't make beef stew without potatoes and onions. But rib beef alone in an emergency can make an ordinary pine door look like a wrought iron gambling house portal to the wolf. With salt and pepper and a tablespoon of flour, first well stirred in a little cold water, it will serve Tis not so deep as a lobster a la Newburgh, nor so wide as a church festival doughnut, but twill serve. Hetty took her stew pan to the rear of the third floor hall. According to the advertisements of the Vallambrosa, there was running water to be found there. Between you, me, and the water meter, it only ambled or walked through the faucets, but technicalities have no place here. There was also a sink where housekeeping rumors often met to dump their coffee grounds and glare at one another's kimonos. At this sink Hetty found a girl with heavy gold-brown artistic hair and plaintive eyes washing two large Irish potatoes. Hetty knew the Vallambrosa as well as anyone not owning double hextra magnifying eyes could compass its mysteries. The kimonos were her, her encyclopedia, her who's what, her clearinghouse of news, of goers and comers. From a rose-pink kimono edged with Nile grain she had learned that the girl with the potatoes was a miniature painter living in a kind of attic, or studio as they prefer to call it, on the top floor. Hetty was not certain in her mind what a miniature was, but it certainly wasn't a house, because house painters, although they wear splashy overalls and poke ladders in your face on the street, are known to indulge in a riotous profusion of food at home. The potato girl was quite slim and small, and handled her potatoes as an old bachelor uncle handles a baby who is cutting teeth. She had a dull shoemaker's knife in her right hand, and she had begun to peel one of the potatoes with it. Hetty addressed her in the punctiliously formal tone of one who intends to be cheerfully familiar with you in the second round. "'Beg pardon,' she said, for butting into what's not my business, but if you peel them potatoes, you lose out. They're new Bermudas. You want to scrape them. Let me show you.' She took a potato and the knife and began to demonstrate. "'Oh, thank you,' breathed the artist. "'I didn't know, and I did hate to see the thick peelings go.' It seemed such a waste, but I thought they always had to be peeled. When you've got only potatoes to eat, the peelings count, you know. Say, kid, said Hetty, staying her knife, you ain't up against it, too, are you? The miniature artist smiled starvedly. I suppose I am. Art, or at least the way I interpret it, doesn't seem to be much in demand. I have only these potatoes for my dinner. But they aren't so bad, boiled and hot with a little butter and salt. Child, said Hetty, letting a brief smile soften her rigid, rigid features, fate has sent me and you together. I've had it handed to me in the neck, too, but I've got a chunk of meat in my room as big as a lapdog, and I've done everything to get potatoes except pray for them. Let's me and you bunch our commissary departments and make a stew of them. We'll cook it in my room, if only we had an onion to go with it. Say, kid, you haven't got a couple of pennies that have slipped down into the lining of your last winter sealskin, have you? I could step down to the corner and get one at old Giuseppe's stand. A stew without an onion is worse than a matinee without candy. You may call me Cecilia, said the artist. No, I spent my last penny three days ago. Then we'll have to cut the onion out instead of slicing it in, said Hetty. I'd ask the janitors for one, but I don't want them hip just yet to the fact I'm pounding the asphalt for another job. But I wish we did have an onion. In the shop girl's room, the two began to prepare their supper. Cecilia's part was to sit on the couch helplessly and beg to be allowed to do something, in the voice of a cooing ringdove. Hetty prepared the rib beef, putting it in cold, salted water in the stew pan and setting it on the one-burner gas stove. "'I wish we had an onion,' said Hetty, as she scraped the two potatoes. 
On the wall opposite the couch was pinned a flaming, gorgeous advertising picture of one of the new ferry boats of the PUFF Railroad that had been built to cut down the time between Los Angeles and New York City one-eighth of a minute. Hetty, turning her head during her continuous monologue, saw tears running from her guest's eyes as she gazed on the idealized presentment of the speeding foam-girdled transport. "'Why, say, Cecilia kid,' said Hetty, poising her knife, "'is it as bad art as that? I ain't a critic, but I thought it kind of brightened up the room. Of course, a manicure painter could tell it was a bum picture in a minute. I'll take it down if you say so. I wish to the holy St. Potluck we had an onion.' But the miniature miniature painter had tumbled down, sobbing, with her nose indenting the hard-woven drapery of the couch. Something was here deeper than the artistic temperament offended at crude lithography. Hetty knew. She had accepted her role long ago. How scant the words with which we try to describe a single quality of a human being. When we reach the abstract, we are lost. The nearer to nature that the babbling of our lips comes, the better do we understand. Figuratively, let us say, some people are bosoms, some are hands, some are heads, some are muscles, some are feet, some are backs for burdens. Hetty was a shoulder. Hers was a sharp, sinewy shoulder, but all her life people had laid their heads upon it, metaphorically or actually, and had left there all or half their troubles. Looking at life anatomically, which is as good a way as any, she was preordained to be a shoulder. There were few truer collarbones anywhere than hers. Hetty was only thirty-three, and she had not yet outlived the little pang that visited her whenever the head of youth and beauty leaned upon her for consolation. But one glance in her mirror always served as an instantaneous painkiller. So she gave one pale look into the crinkly old looking-glass on the wall above the gas stove, turned down the flame a little lower from the bubbling beef and potatoes, went over to the couch, and lifted Cecilia's head to its confessional. "'Go on and tell me, honey,' she said. "'I know now that it ain't art that's worrying you. You met him on a ferry-boat, didn't you?' "'Go on, Cecilia, kid, and tell your, your Aunt Hetty about it.' But youth and melancholy must first spend the surplus of sighs and tears that waft and float the bark of romance to its harbor in the delectable isles. Presently, through the stringy tendons that formed the bars of the confessional, the penitent, or was it the glorified communicant of the sacred flame, told her story without art or illumination. It was only three days ago I was coming back on the ferry from Jersey City. Old Mr. Shrum, an art dealer, told me of a rich man in Newark who wanted a miniature of his daughter painted. I went to see him and showed him some of my work. When I told him the price would be fifty dollars, he laughed at me like a hyena. He said an enlarged crayon twenty times the size would cost him only eight dollars. I had just enough money to buy my ferry ticket back to New York. I felt as if I didn't want to live another day. I must have looked as I felt, for I saw him on the row of seats opposite me, looking at me as if he understood. He was nice looking, but, oh, above everything else, he looked kind. When one is tired or unhappy or hopeless, kindness counts more than anything else. When I got so miserable that I couldn't fight against it any longer, I got up and walked slowly out the rear door of the ferry boat cabin. No one was there, and I slipped quickly over the rail and dropped into the water. Oh, friend Hetty, it was cold, cold. For just one moment I wished I was back in the old Valambrosa, starving and hoping. And then I got numb and didn't care. And then I felt that somebody else was in the water close by me, holding me up. He had followed me and jumped in to save me. Somebody threw a thing like a big white doughnut at us, and he made me put my arms through the hole. Then the ferry boat backed, and they pulled us on board. Oh, Hetty, I was so ashamed of my wickedness in trying to drown myself. And besides, my hair had all tumbled down and was sopping wet, and I was such a sight. And then some men in blue clothes came around. 
and he gave them his card, and I heard him tell them he had seen me drop my purse on the edge of the boat outside the rail, and in leaning over to get it I had fallen overboard. And then I remembered having read in the papers that people who try to kill themselves are locked up in cells with people who try to kill other people, and I was afraid. But some ladies on the boat took me downstairs to the furnace room and got me nearly dry and did up my hair. When the boat landed, he came and put me in a cab. He was all dripping himself, but laughed as if he thought it was all a joke. He begged me, but I wouldn't tell him my name nor where I lived. I was so ashamed. You were a fool, child, said Hetty kindly. Wait till I turn the light up a bit. I wish to heaven we had an onion. Then he raised his hat, went on Cecilia, and said, Very well, but I'll find you anyhow. I'm going to claim my rights of salvage. Then he gave money to the cab driver and told him to take me wherever I wanted to go and walked away. What is salvage, Hetty? The edge of a piece of goods that ain't hemmed, said the shop girl. You must have looked pretty well frazzled out to the little hero boy. It's been three days, moaned the miniature painter, and he hasn't found me yet. Extend the time, said Hetty. This is a big town. Think of how many girls he might have to see soaked in water with their hair down before he would recognize you. Stew's getting on fine, but oh, for an onion. I'd even use a piece of garlic if I had it. The beef and potatoes bubbled merrily, exhaling a mouth-watering savor that yet lacked something, leaving a hunger on the palate, a haunting, wistful desire for some lost and needful ingredient. I came near drowning in that awful river, said Cecilia, shuddering. It ought to have more water in it, said Hetty. The stew, I mean. I'll go get some at the sink. It smells good, said the artist. That nasty old North River, objected Hetty. Smells to me like soap factories and wet setter dogs. Oh, you mean the stew. Well, I wish we had an onion for it. Did he look like he had money? First, he looked kind, said Cecilia. I'm sure he was rich, but that matters so little. When he drew out his bill folder to pay the cabman, you couldn't help seeing hundreds and thousands of dollars in it, and I looked over the cab doors and saw him leave the ferry station in a motor car, and the chauffeur gave him his bearskin to put on, for he was sopping wet, and it was only three days ago. What a fool, said Hetty shortly. Oh, the chauffeur wasn't wet, breathed Cecilia, and he drove the car away very nicely. I mean you, said Hetty, for not giving him your address. I never give my address to chauffeurs, said Cecilia haughtily. I wish we had one, said Hetty disconsolately. What for? For the stew, of course. Oh, I mean an onion. Hetty took a pitcher and started to the sink at the end of the hall. A young man came down the stairs from above, just as she was opposite the lower step. He was decently dressed, but pale and haggard. His eyes were dull with the stress of some burden of physical or mental woe. In his hand he bore an onion, a pink, smooth, solid, shining onion as large around as a ninety-eight-cent alarm clock. Hetty stopped. So did the young man. There was something Joan of Arkish, Herculean, and Una-ish in the look and pose of the shop lady. She had cast off the rolls of Job and Little Red Riding Hood. The young man stopped at the foot of the stairs and coughed distractedly. He felt marooned, held up, attacked, assailed, levied upon, sacked, assessed, panhandled, browbeaten, though he knew not why. It was the look in Henny's eyes that did it. In them he saw the Jolly Roger fly to the masthead, and an able seaman with a dirk between his teeth scurry up the rat lines and nail it there. But as yet he did not know that the cargo he carried was the thing that had caused him to be so nearly blown out of the water without even a parley. "'Beg your pardon,' said Hetty, as sweetly as her dilute acidic acid tones permitted. "'But did you find that onion on the stairs? There was, there was a hole in the paper bag, and I've just come out to look for it.' The young man coughed for half a minute. 
the interval may have given him the courage to defend his own property also he clutched his pungent prize greedily and with a show of spirit faced his grim waylayer no he said huskily i didn't find it on the stairs it was given to me by jack bevins on the top floor if you don't believe it ask him i'll wait until you do i know about bevins said hetty sourly he writes books and things up there for the paper and rags man we can hear the postman guy him all over the house when he brings them thick envelopes back say do you live in the valambrosa i do not said the young man i come to see bevins sometimes he's my friend i live two blocks west what are you going to do with the onion begging your pardon said hetty i'm going to eat it raw yes as soon as i get home haven't you got anything else to eat with it the young man considered briefly no he confessed there's not another scrap of anything in my diggings to eat i think old jack is pretty hard up for grub in his shack too he hated to give up the onion but i worried him into parting with it man said hetty fixing him with her world sapient eyes and laying a bony but impressive finger on his sleeve you've known trouble too haven't you lots said the onion owner promptly but this onion is my own property honestly come by if you will excuse me i must be going listen said hetty paling a little with anxiety raw onion is a mighty poor diet and so is beef stew without one now if you're jack bevan's friend i guess you're nearly right there's a little lady a friend of mine in my room there at the end of the hall both of us are out of luck and we just have potatoes and meat between us they're stewing now but it ain't got any soul there's something lacking to it there's certain things in life that are naturally intended to fit and belong together one is pink cheesecloth and green roses and one is ham and eggs and one is irish and trouble and the other is beef and potatoes with onions and still another is people who are up against it and other people in the same fix the young man went into a protracted paroxysm of coughing with one hand he hugged his onion to his bosom no doubt no doubt said he at length but as i said i must be going because hetty clutched his sleeve firmly don't be a dago little brother don't eat raw onions chip it in towards the dinner and line yourself inside with the best stew you ever licked a spoon over must two ladies knock a gentleman down and drag him inside for the honor of dining with him no harm shall befall you little brother loosen up and fall into line the young man's pale face relaxed into a grin believe i'll go you see said brightening if my onion is good as a credential i'll accept the invitation gladly it's good as that but better as seasoning said hetty you come and stand outside the door till i ask my lady friend if she has any objections and don't run away with that letter of recommendation before i come out hetty went into her room and closed the door the young man waited outside cecilia kid said the shop girl oiling the sharp saw of her voice as well as she could there's an onion outside with a young man attached i've asked him in to dinner you ain't gonna kick are you oh dear said cecilia sitting up and patting her artistic hair she cast a mournful glance at the ferry boat poster on the wall nit said hetty it ain't him you're up against real life now I believe you said your hero friend had money and automobiles. This is a poor skeezix that's got nothing to eat but an onion. But he's easy spoken and not a freshy. I imagine he's been a gentleman, he's so low down now. And we need the onion. Shall I bring him in? I'll guarantee his behavior. Hetty, dear, sighed Cecilia. I'm so hungry. What difference does it make whether he's a prince or a burglar? I don't care bring him in if he's got anything to eat with him hetty went back into the hall the onion man was gone her heart missed a beat and a gray look settled over her face except on her nose and cheekbones and then the tides of life flowed in again for she saw him leaning out of the front window at the other end of the hall she hurried there he was shouting to someone below the noise of the street overpowered the sound of her footsteps 
She looked down over his shoulder, saw whom he was speaking to, and heard his words. He pulled himself in from the window sill and saw her standing over him. Hetty's eyes bored into him like two steel gimlets. Don't lie to me, she said calmly. What were you going to do with that onion? The young man suppressed a cough and faced her resolutely. His manner was that of one who had been bearded sufficiently. I was going to eat it, said he with emphatic slowness, just as I told you before. And you have nothing else to eat at home? Not a thing. What kind of work do you do? I am not working at anything just now. Then why, said Hetty, with her voice set on its sharpest edge, do you lean out of windows and give orders to chauffeurs in green automobiles in the street below? The young man flushed, and his dull eyes began to sparkle. Because, madam, said he, in accelerando tones, I pay the chauffeur's wages, and I own the automobile, and also this onion. This onion, madam. He flourished the onion within an inch of Hetty's nose. The shop lady did not retreat a hair's breadth. Then why do you eat onions, she said, with biting contempt, and nothing else? I never said I did, retorted the young man heatedly. I said I had nothing else to eat where I live. I am not a delicatessen storekeeper. Then why, pursued Hetty inflexibly, were you going to eat a raw onion? My mother, said the young man, always made me eat one for a cold. Pardon my referring to a physical infirmity, but you may have noticed that I have a very, very severe cold. I was going to eat the onion and go to bed. I wonder why I am standing here and apologizing to you for it. How did you catch this cold? went on Hetty suspiciously. The young man seemed to have arrived at some extreme height of feeling. There were two modes of descent open to him, a burst of rage or a surrender to the ridiculous. He chose wisely, and the empty hall echoed his hoarse laughter. You're a dandy, said he. And I don't blame you for being careful. I don't mind telling you. I got wet. I was on a north ferry a few days ago when a girl jumped overboard. Of course I... Hetty extended her hand, interrupting his story. Give me the onion, she said. The young man set his jaw a trifle harder. Give me the onion, she repeated. He grinned and laid it in her hand. Then Hetty's infrequent, grim, melancholy smile showed itself. She took the young man's arm and pointed with her other hand to the door of her room. Little brother, she said, go in there. The little fool you fished out of the river is there waiting for you. Go on in. I'll give you three minutes before I come. Potatoes is in there, waiting. Go on in, onions. After he tapped at the door and entered, Hetty began to peel and wash the onion at the sink. She gave a gray look at the gray roofs outside, and the smile on her face vanished by little jerks and twitches. But it's us, she said grimly to herself. It's us that furnished the beef. End of The Third Ingredient by O. Henry More finely chiseled. And now for Hetty's thumbnail biography while she climbs the two flights of stairs. She walked into the biggest store one morning four years before with seventy five other girls applying for a job behind the waste department counter. The phalanx of wage earners formed a bewildering scene of beauty, carrying a total mass of blonde hair sufficient to have justified the horseback gallops of a hundred Lady Godivas. 
the capable, cool-eyed, impersonal, young, bald-headed man whose task it was to engage six of the contestants was aware of a feeling of suffocation, as if he were drowning in a sea of frangipani, while white clouds, hand-embroidered, floated about him. And then a sail hove into sight. Hetty Pepper, homely of countenance, with small, contemptuous green eyes and chocolate-colored hair, dressed in a suit of plain burlap and a common-sense hat, stood before him with every one of her twenty-nine years of life unmistakably in sight. "'You're on!' shouted the bald-headed young man, and was saved. And that is how Hetty came to be employed in the biggest store." The story of her rise to an eight-dollar-a-week salary is the combined stories of Hercules, Joan of Arc, Una, Job, and Little Red Riding Hood. You shall not learn from me the salary that was paid her as a beginner. There is a sentiment growing about such things, and I want no millionaire store proprietors climbing beef at six cents per butcher's pound. But on the day that Hetty was released by the B.S., the price was seven and one-half cents. That fact is what makes this story possible. Otherwise, the extra four cents would have... But the plot of nearly all the good stories in the world is concerned with shorts who were unable to cover, so you can find no fault with this one. Hetty mounted with her rib beef to her $3.50 third floor back. One hot, savory beef stew for supper, a night's good sleep, and she would be fit in the morning to apply again for the tasks of Hercules, Joan of Arc, Una, Job, and Little Red Riding Hood. In her room she got the graniteware stew pan out of the two-by-four-foot china, or I mean earthenware, closet, and began to dig down in a rat's nest of paper bags for the potatoes and onions. She came out with her nose and chin just a little sharper pointed. There was neither a potato nor an onion. Now what kind of a beef stew can you make out of simply beef? You can make oyster soup without oysters, turtle soup without turtles, coffee cake without coffee, but you can't make beef stew without potatoes and onions. But rib beef alone, in an emergency, can make an ordinary pine door look like a wrought iron gambling house portal to the wolf. With salt and pepper and a tablespoon of flour, The Third Ingredient by O. Henry. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This reading by Tomahaw. The so called Vallambrosa apartment house is not an apartment house. It is composed of two old fashioned brownstone front residences welded into one. The parlor floor of one side is gay with the wraps and headgear of a modiste. The other is lugubrious with the sophistical promises and grisly display of a painless dentist. You may have a room there for two dollars a week, or you may have one for twenty dollars. Among the Vallambrosa's rumors are stenographers, musicians, brokers, shop girls, space rate writers, art students, wiretappers, and other people who lean far over the banister rail when the doorbell rings. This treatise shall have to do with but two of the Vallambrosians though meaning no disrespect to the others. At six o'clock one afternoon, Hetty Pepper came back to her third-floor rear $3.50 room in the Vallambrosa with her nose and chin more sharply pointed than usual. To be discharged from the department store where you've been working four years and with only 15 cents in your purse does have a tendency to make your features appear most well stirred in a little cold water. It will serve. "'Tis not so deep as a lobster a la Newburg, nor so wide as a church festival doughnut, but twill serve." Hetty took her stew pan to the rear of the third floor hall. According to the advertisements of the Vallambrosa, there was running water to be found there. Between you, me, and the water meter, it only ambled or walked through the faucets, but technicalities have no place here. There was also a sink where housekeeping rumors often met to dump their coffee grounds and glare at one another's kimonos. At this sink, Hetty found a girl with heavy gold-brown artistic hair and plaintive eyes washing two large Irish potatoes. Hetty knew the Vallambrosa as well as anyone not owning double hextra magnifying eyes could compass its mysteries. 
The kimonos were her, her encyclopedia, her who's what, her clearinghouse of news, of goers and comers. From a rose-pink kimono edged with Nile grain, she had learned that the girl with the potatoes was a miniature painter living in a kind of attic, or studio as they prefer to call it, on the top floor. Hetty was not certain in her mind what a miniature was, but it certainly wasn't a house, because house painters, although they wear splashy overalls and poke ladders in your face on the street, are known to indulge in a riotous profusion of food at home. The potato girl was quite slim and small, and handled her potatoes as an old bag of fire escape of my tenement house to throw dynamite bombs into my skylight boudoir. The story of Hetty's discharge from the biggest store is so nearly a repetition of her engagement as to be monotonous. In each department of the store there is an omniscient, omnipresent, and omnivorous person carrying always a mileage book and a red necktie, and referred to as a buyer. The destinies of the girls in his department who live on, see Bureau of Victual Statistics, so much per week are in his hands. This particular buyer was a capable, cool-eyed, impersonal, young, bald-headed man. As he walked along the aisles of his department, he seemed to be sailing on a sea of frangipani, while white clouds, machine-embroidered, floated around him. Too many sweets bring surfeit. He looked upon Hetty Pepper's homely countenance, emerald eyes, and chocolate-colored hair as a welcome oasis of green in a desert of cloying beauty. In a quiet angle of a counter, he pinched her arm kindly, three inches above the elbow. She slapped him three feet away with one good blow of her muscular and not especially lily-white right. So now you know why Eddie Pepper came to leave the biggest store at thirty minutes' notice with one dime and a nickel in her purse. This morning's quotations list the price of rib 